I'm Gordon Palmer, minister at Claremont Parish Church, and welcome to our watch night service, which once more we are recording and, and sending out online. It's great to have you along. We're going to begin our service with the, one of the um, best known and most loved of carols, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let us pray. Lord God, Christmas is a time that we associate with joy, with celebration. It's a time when we welcome your coming, your becoming one of us. And so it's a joy that is deep and serious, for here is salvation. Here is the coming of the God who was giving his life as a ransom, who was at great cost offering a sacrifice for us. We rejoice that you came 
in order to serve, not to lord it over others, that you came not to be put on some pedestal, but to spend and be spent on behalf of others. Lord, that's good news for us. It was something you did at enormous cost, something that you did because you love and because you care. Lord, it's staggering for us to try and get our minds around the reality that you came to die for sinners, that you came to suffer for us. But Lord, that's true and good news. And so it is a cause for joy that sinners can be made right with God, that there can be release for captives, new life for those dead in sin, light for those walking in darkness. And so help us to see beyond the babe to God with us. Help us to see beyond the details of shepherds, wise travelers, to the real meaning that God is for us. And help us to see beyond just whatever we make our Christmas to be, to realize that it is God with us. Amen. Now, the Scripture reading um, for our service this evening comes from Mark's Gospel, um, and it's when Jesus is with his disciples. And Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, Jesus asked them, who do people say that I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked? Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen. And so the question, or one of the questions in and through and around that passage is just the the identity of this babe who was born at Bethlehem and what he became. And so we sing the Christmas carol, Infant Holy, Infant Lowly.
Well, Christmas and uh, gosh, there's lots of questions around, lots of quizzes that people get. So I thought, well, it's Christmas. I'll maybe get one in before Christmas Day is finally upon us. So it's Christmas time. It's quiz time. We're going to put up some uh, pictures. I think there's 16 in all of Fox and see how many of these that you can recognize. Now, I would love to say I've got a prize here to give somebody who, who does best. But of course, since it's online, I can't quite do that. Um, made some of the... Uh, folks that you're going to see, I, I think easy enough that everybody's going to get some, but I also have made some a bit harder so that I don't think, and here's the challenge for you, I don't think anyone is going to recognize all 16. So have a look, and who do you think they are? Okay, well, you're going to have to be honest. You're going to have to mark your own papers, you know. Uh, first one, of course, was uh, Billy Connolly. Um, then we had Billy Shakespeare. Um, then we had Silly Billy, Nigel Farage. Um, Usain Bolt came after him. And then it was Doris Day. Did you recognize Adele? I'm sure many of you would have got that. Margaret Atwood. Ah, and that was meant to be one of the harder ones. Uh, the author, of course, Handmade Tale, and amongst other things. Then there's Chris Hoy, keeping up the kind of Celtic uh, fringe theme there. We've got, then got David Trimble, um, Dina Asher-Smith, Tom Cruise, Pavarotti, Laura Kenny. Maybe stretching the memory banks a wee bit for some folks, back to Willie Brandt. Then there was Pierce Morgan, and the 16th was Sarah Millican. How many did you get? Well, <clears throat> also, they weren't just a kind of random collection entirely. I kind of thought of them in, in pairs. You know, Billy Connolly and Sarah Millican are both uh, comedians. Shakespeare and Margaret Atwood, both writers. Usain Bolt and Dina Asher-Smith, both sprinters. Doris Day and Tom Cruise, both actors. Adele and Pavarotti, singers. Chris Hoy and Laura Kenny, cyclists. Trimble and Willie Brandt, politicians. Pierce Morgan and Nigel Farage. Well, I reckon they deserve each other. They're all to some extent famous. But, and they're quite different, even though there's, they're in pairs, they don't all match up with, for all of them. There's, but one thing they have in common is they're not particularly well known because of the way in which they were born. Usain Bolt and Dina Asher-Smith didn't speed out of their mother's wombs faster than everyone else. Adele and Pavarotti weren't born singing, maybe born screaming, but not singing. Kenny and Hoy were not able to ride a bike right away and cycling along into the postnatal ward. Connolly and Milliken did not come out wisecracking, having the maternity ward in stitches. And so I know none of them were famous for what happened when they were born. And that's the case with almost all of us. Perhaps one or two folks become famous because they were the first test tube baby or the first whatever. But even if someone does make it into the papers due to an unusual birth, it hardly becomes something that they can dine out on for the rest of their lives. And suppose someone was writing a, bo a biography of some of these guys. Suppose someone was writing a biography of Doris Day, or someone was writing a biography of Sarah Millican, or somebody was writing a biography of David Trimble. And suppose the biography only consisted of the details of what happened the day they were born, 
Would such a book be of interest? No. Would such a book sell? No. It's what comes later that makes its impact. And that's not really any different in Jesus' case. Yes, there are some very unusual aspects about his birth. The star coming a bit later, um, the shepherds on, on the night where he was born, the circumstances around how he was born. But they, if they have any significance for us at all, it's, they're simply signs laying in a foundation pointing to what was to come. In the Bible, we get four different accounts of Jesus' life in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And two of the four, Mark and John, don't even mention Jesus' birth. No Bethlehem, no inn, no innkeeper, no shepherds, no wise men, nothing. They can tell the story of Jesus without the birth at Bethlehem. Of course, they both acknowledge that Jesus was born and, and say, here he is. But the, what matters is what Jesus did later. And in that respect, he's not much different from anybody else. But in another aspect, he differs from all of these. These folks that we saw up there, they did different things, famous for different things, but a lot of what they were about was simply a matter of take it or leave it, or personal choice. Do you like pop music or do you like classical music? It's a matter of opinion. Do you think someone in a race sprinting is more exciting to watch than someone cycling? It's a matter of opinion, I suppose. Which comedians are funny and which comedians are not funny? Again, it's a matter of taste and, and opinion. But Jesus is not offering something that's for us as a matter of personal choice and taste. Because if Jesus is who he claimed to be, if the clues given at his birth that were then filled out by the things he de did and the things he said in his ministry, if they were done in such a way that gives credibility to his claims, then his claims are of ultimate significance for all of us. Now, in the passage that I read earlier from the Bible in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is posing a question. First of all, the question's quite general. Who do, who do people say that I am? You know, what's, what's going on? what are the guys at the pub saying? What are the folks at the bus stop sort of making of all this? Who are they saying that I am? But then Jesus flipped the question and says to the disciples, yeah, but who do you say that I am? And that's the ultimate question that Jesus poses, not just to the disciples then, but to the rest of the world, because Jesus' claim is not just that he was a clever teacher, not just that he had a few good ideas, not just that he had something to show us that might make life a wee bit better for us, that might make life a wee bit more exciting. No, he was the creator who had come to give his life as a ransom for many. He was the creator who had come into the world as one of us in order to bear the sins of the world. And beyond that and beyond his resurrection and beyond his ascending back to the Father, he said, at the end of time, he will come again. And that will be a day of judgment. And once more, Jesus will say, who do you say that I am? Santa wants you to be good, so they say, before deciding if he's going to give you a present or not. Jesus is not saying, well, have you been good? Have you been better than anyone else? In fact, the gospel starts with us realizing and recognizing that we're not good enough and that we need a Savior. And if we didn't need a Savior, there would have been no point in Jesus coming. The gospel says we do need a saviour, and that saviour is not just one who is reaching out in love now, but one who at the end of time will judge us and say, who do you say that I am? Again, at least some of these 16 uh, people whose uh, pictures we showed you are, are people who are looking for some kind of response. Comedian wants you to laugh. 
Adele wants you to buy her records, and so on. And Jesus, too, is looking for a response. And in that reading, again, that we read, he, he moved on from saying, who do you say that I am, to saying, now, if that's true, the way to follow me is to become my disciple, to take up your cross and follow. I'm not just for Christmas. I'm not just for uh, religious bits of life. I'm not just for a now and then kind of thing. It's everything or nothing. It's not about being rich and enjoying your riches and then having a wee bit of religion. No, it's about putting me first. And if anyone, Jesus said, is ashamed of me and my words, I will be ashamed of him when, he come, when I come to my Father's glory. Christmas involves responses. If you get a Christmas present, say you get a, a voucher for afternoon tea for two, or maybe a voucher for a helicopter ride, you know, you have to make a response. You have to, as it were, take this cash in the voucher. You have to take it to the, the right place to get the afternoon tea for two, or to get the helicopter ride, or whatever it is. Without you making that response, it's just a wee bit of paper, no more or no less important than any other wee bit of paper. If you're given chocolates, you make a response. You know what to do with them. If someone's given you a recipe book and there's a response called for, let's try out some of the recipes and, and, and see. Otherwise, what's the point? Similarly, what's the point in Jesus if he's not that important, if he's not one who we respond to as he, looks in for, as he wants us to? If God offers us a saviour then, if the one born at Bethlehem, about whom there was that first 2,000 years ago, if, there is, if he really is the one who made such huge claims and backed them up, how do we get the most out of God's gift? And the Christmas good news is that God really wants you to enjoy his gift, to have life in all its fullness. Are you hoping that folk enjoy, you, enjoy what you've got them for Christmas? Of course you are. You wouldn't give them otherwise. God, too, wants us to enjoy what he has got us for Christmas and for all of life. His son, life in all its fullness. You can have it absolutely free, no charge, except it calls us to give our all for him. Not just a wee baby, but the Lord of life and the one who will come again to judge the world. Don't just settle for general impressions, who do people say that I am? How will you answer that very direct question that Jesus put to his disciples and that he will put to us all at the end of time? Who do you say that I am? Amen. Now we're going to sing again, and we're going to sing the carol, Joy to the World.
Let us pray. Lord, you came to bring joy to the world. You came not to give us increased burdens of having to keep other rules. You came not to give us the challenge of making ourselves good enough for you. You came not demanding that we have sussed everything, that we know all the answers, but you came to be a savior. You came to serve, to give your life as a ransom for others so that we might have forgiveness, so that we might have peace with God, so that we might have freedom, so that we might know more of the beauty of your creation and trust in the hope of coming at the end of time of your new creation. You came to bring a new enjoyment to life through having a Savior who died for us, who rose for us, and who calls us to follow. And so, Lord, we pray that this Christmas we might hear with a freshness that challenge of Jesus. We pray that we might hear with greater clarity that question that says, who do you say that I am? And Lord, help us to answer honestly. And help us to follow faithfully. That Christmas might not just be a season, but a life experience. Not a life experience of endless presents, endless rounds of turkey and stuffing and so on, but an endless experience of God with us. God among us. God leading, God blessing, God healing, God making you. Lord, help us to know that and to live and enjoy that this Christmas and always. Amen. Well, now, assuming that, uh, well, for those of you who have been watching the, the service live, as it were, when it's been um, being broadcast, then this will be our beginning of Christmas Day 2021. May I wish all of you a very happy and blessed Christmas. And may you know the joy of God with us, God among us. We're going to conclude our service by singing the uh, Christmas carol, O Come All Ye Faithful. And as while we're singing that Christmas carol, I'll be lighting the um, candle, the final candle on our Advent ring that speaks to us of God is here. The light of the world has come. O come, all you faithful.
So thanks again, everyone, for joining with us for our service, our watch night service for Christmas 2021. Um, just a reminder that the Christmas Day service uh, goes out at half past ten in, uh, today, half past ten later this morning, um, again online. And also to say also at half past ten tomorrow on Boxing Day, um, there will be a, a family service here in person at, at Claremont. And you're welcome to um, enjoy these with us if you possibly can. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all this Christmas and forevermore. Amen.